Okay, uh, so today we have uh, our first uh, Jenkins end user panel. So the idea is to have inverted discussion, so not contributors presenting to users, but the end users talking uh, to contributors, uh, presenting their experiences, expertise, actions from Jenkins. And then uh, contributors who are on the call just asking questions, providing some feedback. And again, uh, everyone is welcome to participate in this discussion, either by voice or by chat. Um, and uh, I suggest that, that uh, we start uh, from um, Andrei because uh, he was the first to respond. So Andrei, would you like uh, to speak about your experiences and quickly introduce yourself to the community? Yeah, hi, my name is Andrei Babushkin and currently I work for Intel in Intel Open Vino to Kit project. Uh, and we use Jenkins. We use Jenkins since the inception of our project. Uh, it, uh, as far as I remember, it's 2018 and the uh, oldest uh, Jenkins version I was able to find is uh, 2.89 or so. So we have seen uh, many updates. Uh, we've seen uh, how Jcask was created. Uh, We've seen uh, UI improvements. Uh, we, I think we have uh, upgrade issues only once and I can't remember when it was last time. So this part of Jenkins is very, very great. And um, most of uh, user experience issues, uh, I think is uh, connected uh, with the fact that OpenMina is not a Java project, right? So we don't have any Java experience. And, uh, you know, when something goes wrong with Jenkins or in Jenkins pipeline, there are huge stack traces uh, mentioning some strange uh, concepts, some uh, deep inside uh, pipeline uh, CSP code and uh, that's a bit confusing. Uh, other issues uh, we have, uh, like our pipelines is such big that uh, we was forced to split them into a separate, few separate jobs because we can just put all uh, stages in a single pipeline, uh, use spiral step and run all builds on all Linuxes on um, flavors on Windows and on Mac and run tests uh, because when you try to upload Jen uh, test results to Jenkins build, uh, it puts uh, like we there's no way to uh, separate few uh, test executions in test in Jenkins test report and. Uh, other issue is uh, sometimes we need to um, more powerful build dependencies than just upstream downstream relationship, right? We sometimes we want to specify that this build is dependent of, from this build and this build, and uh, currently we cannot do this in uh, our multi-job pipeline, right? So. Basically, that's all that I was thinking of a uh, few day for a few days after uh, end user UX panel announcement. So I think that's all. It's uh, nice examples, um, and yeah, maybe a few quick questions before we move. Uh, on uh, so for splitting executions and test reports, have you seen uh, the new code coverage API uh, plugin? Uh, I may have seen, but mm -hmm. uh, I had a chance to uh, try it. Yeah, so yeah, why I'm asking because it actually supports splitting code reports uh, by uh, various factors and tags and programming languages if you want. So if uh, the user experience today is what you would like to see, maybe it could be a good referral uh, for an issue. I believe that the uh, GUnit plugin currently uses GitHub issues and Tim who is on the call, uh, he's currently one of the maintainers 
of uh, the GUnit plugin. So. Yeah, but uh, like test reports is just one example of why we need to split our jobs, uh, uh, our pipeline to a few jobs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, other thing is uh, uh, amount of logs we need to see and uh, like we've tried to put this into one big pipeline, um, but like just imagine you have uh, parallel steps with uh, Ubuntu, CentOS, uh, uh, Debian, and uh, Windows and macOS, and inside each parallel stage, you need also parallelize uh, test executions. Right, and uh, we actively use Blue Ocean for visualizations to uh, see logs. And in, when you try to um, use parallel stages inside parallel stages, uh, it just show it just shows you nothing. So, so um, yeah. if you use the classic UI, yeah. the JUnit report will show you reports by stage and group things by stage. So you can actually have a slightly better overview. Um, I still don't think it's gonna be great for what you want, but it might be much better than Blue Ocean for you. Uh, no, Blue, Blue Ocean is actually better because uh, in each uh, of, B, uh, of build jobs and test jobs, we split our pipeline few, uh, for a few stages like, uh, copy artifacts, uh, unpack artifacts, run tests, uh, write results, uh, something like that. And if we see this in uh, classic UI, we just see the latest stage and in the latest stage. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking about the stage overview or anything like that. I'm purely talking about the test result reports. As in, mm -hmm. if you go to the uh, build slash test report you will get kind of um I'm, I'm just trying to pull up an example on my instance so i can tell you exactly rather than just going i think it works like this based on my memory um so if you bear with me for two minutes um or hopefully less than that um... yeah, while we talk about uh, that um, about um, job relations uh, what uh, did you expect? Uh, something like uh, a cyclic dependency graph, uh, or how would you like uh, the jobs uh, to be executed? What's your main problem with the current triggering? Uh, actually, I, I think, uh, like I saw uh, a GitHub Actions pipeline recently, and uh, in GitHub Actions, we can specify uh, a stage dependency. Uh, a dependency that depends uh, from two or more stages. So this stage uh, will be executed only after all stages mm -hmm. it depends from will be executed. So something like that. Yeah. yeah so basically, I think, uh, graph, yeah. Uh, so when you define target milestones like a make file, and you don't really care how, what's the order of execution of targets. So it's quite a popular topic. Personally, I think that um, uh, Jenkins pipeline engine supports it in principle, but it uh, requires a significant uh, rework of how our details are implemented. So right now there is no way to actually implement it in uh, Jenkins. You can just uh, have parallel uh, jobs, uh, which well, basically start from very beginning then you could probably use a join or milestones plugin to actually do some dependencies, but it would be quite complicated. Mm -hmm. We so, actually have tried to use, uh, I don't know the name of the plugin, uh, but uh, it has added a um, stage like a wait uh, or something like that. But it seems there was some bug in this plugin and we uh, have received some deadlocks in our pipeline. So we stopped using that. But actually we use Jenkins not only for continuous integration purposes. We run many, many uh, 
tests in our nightly and weekly validation cycles. Uh, and our weekly cycle is uh, about 3,000 uh, Jenkins builds, and it's quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, the, the classic test results are exactly the same as the Blue Ocean test results in that it only shows you grouping if a test has failed. Um, so you get the full stage name. So apologies about saying it was better than Blue Ocean. It's okay, exactly no problem. Well, for once. Uh, okay. Uh, any questions to Andre uh, about use cases or should we move on? Uh, because yeah, we still have an opportunity to discuss particular topics, for example, during Ignite talks. If someone uh, wants to hack a uh, duck uh, support for pipeline uh, a few hours, uh, but we have any questions? Yes. So thanks, Andre. And yeah, I think that we could try a deep uh, dive uh, later. So for example, if your team will want uh, to join together so that we deep dive into your topics, Actually, I had the honor to go to Nizhny Novgorod and present there at one of the meetups. Uh, and yeah, I know that there is a lot of Jenkins users there, so we could organize something specifically to definitely use case. For example, if you're interested in JCast and Pipeline, you can invite contributors and work together. It's such a yeah. deep dive. Yeah, so I, I try to contribute a little bit, but uh, mm -hmm. once I broke, uh, many years with my changes so now i'm afraid of it welcome to the club yeah <laughs> okay thanks a lot and let's move to your uh would you like to introduce yourself sure um so hello everybody nice being on this uh, group um i am um a life and data scientist working for a pharmaceutical company and for a minute, I wanted to sort of forget everything you know about Jenkins and actually remember everything about Jenkins. Uh, but what we're talking about um, is actually uh, outside the standard DevOps operations. And um, it, all like, is it possible for me to share slides or can you? Yeah, you, you can just uh, share your screen. Okay. Uh, you should be able to do that. If not, I will uh, fix it, but you should okay. have permission. So there's a share screen a green button on your control panel. Is it? Yep. Okay, can you see the, the slide? Yes, uh, okay. thank you. Good, so I, I put these slides together just uh, so that you have a frame of reference later on if you want to go back and uh, you know uh, refresh your mind on some of these things that may be a little bit out of the uh, standard realm of, of what we're doing with, with Jenkins. Um, but back uh, in 2013, I discovered Jenkins. Um, my, myself, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a trained uh, PhD uh, molecular biologist, uh, but I went back to school. I got a master's in software engineering, and I was for a long time interested in, in software development. And I'm in, a, in an interesting um, intersection of, of uh, medicine and uh, data science now, which makes a lot of these things really, really interesting. So back in 2013, um, I discovered Jenkins and has been using it since then, um, but we've been using it for a total different uh, application. And uh, a few years ago, we published this paper in scientific literature where we introduced Jenkins uh, as a platform for scientific uh, data and image processing applications. And it has nothing to do with um, actual compilation of code, testing code, and so on. Uh, but nonetheless, it uses all of the capabilities of, of Jenkins. Uh, so I, I really want to start by, by thanking a lot of uh, people that have been um, sort of uh, fundamental in this process. And, um, interestingly enough, my uh, boss at the time was called Jeremy Jenkins. Um, and, uh, you know, over the years, I've met many of the Jenkins contributors and uh, very nice people in the group like Oleg and Marky and even 
Lashuki, who visited uh, Novartis a few years ago, Jesse. Um, importantly, my colleague uh, who is now um, in New Zealand, Bruno Kinoshida, who developed some of the uh, key plugins uh, for this and uh, participants in the GSOC 2020 last year, where we developed a machine learning plugin for, um, uh, for Jenkins. So uh, why use Jenkins for life science applications? Really, uh, there are a lot of standardized um, things that Jenkins offers that are key enablers, uh, such as the accessibility of the jobs via a web portal, the freestyle parameterized jobs, uh, easy deployment, you know, the super rich plugin ecosystem. I'm not gonna read this, this, this whole list, uh, but these are what I call sort of the standard enablers of Jenkins that have made this possible. And the benefits that this offers is that um, life and data science pipelining um, really requires the integration of a lot of different utilities, applications, custom script tools, and Jenkins is able to do all of that. Um, finally, we have developed this concept of one-page web apps on a shoestring. Um, people can go to a Jenkins job interface and, and um, be able to execute an entire uh, data analysis or data ingestion and, and processing and parsing uh, in a very reproducible um, way that leaves a really good, what we call data provenance path, where we can always determine where the data came from. And finally, through this similar uh, web portal, we're able to, to share this data with others and, 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 and collaborate. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, uh, you know, there is a kind of an e e impedance mismatch between development um, operations and, and science. And just to, always as a kind of uh, funny point, I bring this, this word artifact that we're using in Jenkins. And of course, artifact is used with the idea of something that Jenkins creates, but for science, this is really a spurious observation and a bad thing, um, something that you do not want. So, you know, just that a really kind of simple um, example of, of nomenclature where things are, are different. But let's look at uh, specifically a pipelines, jobs and, and builds. Uh, for developers, we check out of code from the SCM, the pipelines are more consistent and continuous. The jobs require very few parameters. The builds are almost always deleted and the artifacts are automatically tested. Um, on the scientific side though, they, uh, there's nothing such as the concept of an SEM for, for data and um, instruments. The files are all over the place, uh, whether it's on, on a particular instrument, on a local or network drive. The pipelines are really discontinuous. It consists of an ad hoc mix of the Jenkins jobs. Um, different tasks are encapsulated in separate jobs that need to provide input and output to each other. The builds are almost never deleted because this is really primary data that you're generating. It's not a kind of a, you're not superseding old data, or old uh, jars or old builds. And the artifacts are really inspected, annotated, and curated by the scientists rather than, than in an automatic way. Um, another uh, sort of uh, impedance mismatch here is around job configuration. You know, for, for developers now, you know, we're moving more and more, the pipeline as code. Um, uh, you know, um, Andrew mentioned the Blue Ocean project, and I had some questions around its status because it really looked interesting at the beginning because it starts approaching the, uh, some of the requirements that uh, scientists have around visual editors for configuring um, the jobs. But I, I have tried to use it, and I realized that actually it's more for, you know, kind of um, the, the, the build stage and, and, and larger um, sort of um, um, not so granular that it is useful for uh, configuring parameters and, and, um, and we use a lot of the freestyle parameterized jobs, which is not very common for the developers. Um, so what we're missing and still is sort of this uh, configuration, exploration, dependency management, understanding where these things is. 
What you see on the right hand side is a kind of my attempt to roll my own. This is actually the parameters in a, in a particular uh, job and they depend on each other. Um, and so, and they depend on Groovy scripts and scriptlets that are executed uh, as part of the job. So this is sort of, you know, our own version of trying to understand the configuration better, but it would be great if we had a kind of a um, better supported tool. Search and metadata are um, still issues, I think, in the standard version of Jenkins. Searching for artifacts across different builds is still very difficult. Um, build level metadata is not searchable uh, and it's not generated very easily. Uh, and the same thing across builds. Um, I think actually Andrew may have touched on this as well around the artifact relationships. Uh, I call it relational builds where, you know, um, a downstream build may depend from two or three upstream uh, builds. And um, it's very difficult to sort of document that. And it's even more difficult to do a cascade delete, which we would like to do if you, if you delete a primary artifact on which a bunch of analysis are um, dependent on downstream, you would like to have the opportunity to at least identify those, devalidate them and, and um, delete them. Um, here is a concept that is critical for what we're doing and is totally missing from Jenkins. What we call this is the interactive pre-builds. A lot of activity going on before you even start the build. Um, and this has to do with the fact that uh, starting a complicated um, analysis in R, Python, image processing, whatever, requires the um, selection of a bunch of parameters that they may be appropriate or not for the analysis. And going through a full build cycle, um, it's, it's um, very uh, expensive. Um, and so what we have actually uh, would like to do is have a bunch of um, pre-built artifacts generated um, from by selecting different parameters um, and having the ability to generate a set of artifacts each out of these those parameters. And then all the build does, these are some examples of the kind of uh, artifacts we're talking about. We're talking about um, images, we're talking about uh, scientific, uh, you know, um, analysis and that you visualize through graphs and uh, even, you know, data tables and, and so on. And uh, all the build does at the end is archives and reports these pre-built artifacts. Uh, so, for example, here you can see uh, there is a report with uh, six different pre-built artifacts uh, that have, are using different algorithms and different uh, parameters to generate and, um, you know, we have managed, and this is the amazing thing about Jenkins that's still sort of, uh, it, it's one of the greatest joys to work with it because, you know, you can, you can get it to do a lot of different things, right? Even, even these uh, uh, pre-builds that I think the, the concept is missing from it. Now, um, it's something that uh, may not go well um, with a lot of people is please don't let security eat the function. Um, you know, Groovy, script execution, inline JavaScript, HTML are keys for the kind of things that we're doing. And we have been struggling and struggling to maintain their functionality in the present uh, scheme of, of uh, security improvements. Um, you know, I know that uh, Bruno has been very good at fixing security um, um, warnings and so on, but it's just the nature of what we're, we're doing. Uh, finally, I would like to say that, you know, we're talking about a lot of big companies that are using Jenkins and about a lot of, um, uh, you know, big installations of Jenkins, but for the life sciences and data sciences, we cannot forget uh, how Jenkins would fit into sort of the environment of an academic lab. Um, where, you know, there is uh, an academic lab doing some research, they need to, to deal with their data and their uh, laboratory instruments, and they do have one developer there. Um, it would be great if that developer can apply some of these, these uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, jobs that we have, are developing for um, life science integration and data science 
um, in a rather easy way. Um, and that's it. I, I will leave you with a set of, of references. And, and uh, if anyone is interested in hearing a little bit more about this, I think we have an Ignite session on uh, applications uh, of Jenkins and, and data sciences a little bit uh, later. And we'll go in a little bit more detail on, on this. And again, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this uh, on behalf of uh, perhaps voices that you've never heard before. <laughs> so thank yeah. you, Alec, for inviting me. Yeah, and thanks a lot for your feedback. Uh, if you want to do an extended session, uh, yeah, Jenkins Online Meetup uh, always welcomes you. And yeah, there is a lot of good points. Uh, definitely, we, it would be worth uh, discussing. Like, I especially appreciate the point about security and yeah, things like World Ocean. Yeah, we discussed them a lot at the previous summits. And I think that it's a really valid point uh, from an user standpoint uh, who actually want to keep Jenkins as a framework uh, for use cases like bioinformatics or whatever, where you still do not get like things out of the box, but you want to use the uh, power of Jenkins as an automation engine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Great, uh, it's great to see this uh, angle. So any questions from others, feedback? Uh, yeah, gonna, I just want to add something uh, about security. I need to make a confession uh, because since uh, the beginning of our project, we use uh, permissive script security plugin. And uh, we use it just because uh, we are not creating new plugins. Instead, we put all our custom functions, functions uh, GitHub API integrations, GitLab API integrations, uh, something like that into our uh, Jenkins shared library. And uh, in the beginning, we, we have seen uh, many uh, messages from script security plugin, and we just decided to turn it off. So it's, I think it's not good, but it's much easier to uh, just turn it off uh, in order to allow our code to be executed. Uh, well, I have to make it coming out. You are not the only user using this yeah. plugin in production. Uh, but yeah, um, I understand the point. And uh, fortunately, we don't have Wadi Congenial here. So we can discuss this topic even more. Uh, one question before. So for Victor and Ivan, how much time you need approximately uh, for review and discussion? Because yeah, you have some time constraints. Ivan, Victor, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, 10 minutes or something like that, no more. Uh, yes, yeah, so yeah, basically we have uh, 10 minutes more. So would you like to continue with uh, feedback from Ianis for now or rather take it uh, offline? Because yeah, there is a lot of feedback to discuss. I think it would be rather feasible to have a, something like one hour session or maybe on half a session together with uh, whomever is interested and talk. Uh, what do you think about that? I actually prefer more of the things that uh, we are talking before is the, the pain points that we have in Jenkins as the UI and, and the, the mm -hmm. scalability, maturity of clients, this kind of stuff. So okay. we can continue discussing. Uh, are you ready, Victor? Okay, so let's... Uh, Continue then. I mean... Yeah, I, I want to make a point uh, about the, the the use the, the try to to avoid the the security script plugin to in the Jenkins uh, shared library. Uh, we have a, a really big uh, shared library, and we don't need to to approve any any script or or use that plugin for anything. We can uh, we we will manage to. To do everything that we want without have to work around the script security plugin with uh, scripts, with uh, binaries, with other things. So uh, I, I think that this is not required to to use the plugin. You can always find uh, some way to to do the same thing in in a best way that is uh, keeping the security plugin in, in there. There are some plugins like. Uh... Pipeline uh, utility steps uh, like uh, Node API iterator. Uh, 
for me, for example, it was always the case when I needed uh, to do custom scheduling. I was using Node Iterator API, which would allow me to query nodes and uh, schedule my pipelines, uh, uh, my uh, subtasks uh, for parallel on pipelines using them. But uh, yeah, still, uh, there are many cases when uh, direct access to binary API would be beneficial. And uh, for you, Yannis, uh, what uh, are the common use cases? As long as you're doing it in a global shared library, I don't think you hit script security. If you're trying to use it in a um, in your own pipeline or a folder one, you will, but not in global. Yeah, it's exactly uh, this. We we are loading our library uh, in the runtime, so uh, I think it has uh, restrictions uh, as the library which is connected to to a folder. And uh, uh, there's too much code already to rewrite, rewrite right? So um, that's why we keep using uh, permissive script security plugin. It's too hard for us to uh, rewrite our old code uh, in order to not to uh, interfere with script security. Is, is there a reason you're not using a global one and just a folder one? It should just be. If you moved it to global, then I think it would just work. Yeah, yeah but but we can't. We use a library step to load our library dynamically. We need this for versioning. In our case, a lot of the scripts are part of the uh, parameters in the UI. Uh, we're using the active choices um, plugin that uh, creates uh, sort of interactive cascading parameters and also uh, creates for us these um, HTML and JavaScript elements that we're interested for more interaction in um, introducing graphics libraries, uh, scientific libraries, imaging, and so on. And uh, yeah, all of those for us, we need to go and, and approve those uh, scripts. <clears throat> For versioning, we use uh, tags in the hit the repository, and we have a, 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 a current tag that is used in, in all the pipelines, and we have some regression or wherever. We move that tag that is the current to the previous one, and we uh, fix the, the issue in the time. We release the, the, the library 10 times, five, between five and 10 times a week, and we manage to have the the library in version it without any issues in the three years that we are using the library more or less yeah i should say that i don't think i have deactivated the um security plugin uh, or use the the other plugin that the permissives um uh, permissions whatever it's called um but we have uh, tinkered around with a uh, what was called a wasp uh, um, renderer or something like that in the um, in the startup of Jenkins, so that it will allow HTML and things like that to to be rendered. Sorry, Oleg, I don't know if I'm using the right nomenclature for that one. No, that's fine. Um, so uh, this is one of the topics like you were saying about the usability. Um, so I want to be the voice as well from some of the users that we have at Elastic. Like some of them find really hard when you run so many things in parallel on a pipeline to debug what's going on, right? So that's one of the issues we hear about quite often, how to make this easier to debug from the console output and so on. Um, because sometimes it, it doesn't even reload correctly the, the logs uh, in the UI. So that's probably one of the issues uh, from, from the point of view of the usability I would like to highlight. And also about the usability, I think that's also a good point. Um, the one regarding uh, to make the life easier from the end user, how to restart a particular stage when the build of that particular pipeline fail, it not 
working in all the cases. And that's probably one of the key areas as well, how we can make people way of working with the Jenkins uh, pipelines easier, that they don't really need to wait for, as I already hear, like some builds take hours and so on. So how you can only run a particular stage of a pipeline easily without going through the entire uh, pipeline as well. That's something as well I haven't here. I haven't found an easy way to do that. And that's what I listen from our users quite often as well. So there's probably a couple of points that I would like to point just in case we don't have time for the presentation of what we do and how we do things in Elastic with Amelia Jenkins. Yeah, uh, for that, uh, one of our approaches is that we could use Ignite Talks because we don't have so many Ignite Talks submitted at the moment. So we could just have your session there uh, after Ignite Talks and uh, just uh, deep dive. Oh, here's Wally coming. So he missed the, the most interesting part. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot. Um, we have something like one minute before we start breakout rooms. And yeah, right now I'm not 100% sure how Mark can figure them. Uh, so yeah, I'm trying to figure it out at the moment. Uh, so I believe that we do them in this room, but I, I don't see breakouts configured there, to be honest. So I'll stop the recording and then we can figure it out together if needed. So thanks a lot. And again, we will be doing uh, another session uh, um, uh, with Elastic uh, during night talks. So thanks a lot. <laughs>